full friends. And I always love finishing another book of the Bible. It's always a cool, exciting thing. Um, but today, Paul is going to be writing to pretty much all of his friends that are in Rome. And um, I'm going to read a story uh, before we get going. Um, but how many of you guys know Jackie Robertson? Or Robinson? Yeah, Jackie Robinson. He was the first black uh, major league baseball player uh, breaking the color barrier. I believe he was, um, he put on his first jersey in 1947, which I think is the, the year before Israel became a nation. So it's kind of, there's a lot of stuff going on back then. It's big stuff. But in those days, he faced like these like daring uh, crowds and people really hostile towards um, him. And one day while playing at his home stadium in Brick, uh, Brooklyn, he made like a huge error. And the fans began just to like ridicule him and just make, call him all sorts of names. And they yelled at him and he was just humiliated and he was just at second base, just fully just embarrassed and humiliated. And like the whole fans are just giving him like a huge hard time. Well, the shortstop Pee Wee uh, Reese came over and he put his arm around um, uh, Jackie and he just stood there next to him, just had his arm around him and he looked at the crowd and all of a sudden the whole stadium just came to a silence. And Robinson later said that that arm around his shoulder saved his career. And I like how, you know, like Jesus is a friend that sticks like closer to a brother. And, um, and that's like a true friend too will stick closer to you than like your actual like blood brother. And those who are in the church, um, they'll stand by us in our times of, you know, trouble. And I believe that's what like the church needs to be. We need to, you know, come alongside of each other uh, to stand next to one another in hard times. And it's so important to, you know, get plugged in and involved like at church and with like the body of Christ and, um, and not to be that lone ranger Christian. It's important to be very, you know, active and participating and not be like a tourist, but just to come in and roll up our sleeves and make lifetime friends. And I'm sure all of you guys have made lifetime friends, like in the body of Christ, um, at all the different churches that you've been to. But today we're going to see how Paul, he had so many believing Christian friends um, who served with him in ministry. And I, I love that about Paul. He he's got friends and he's a guy that was always making friends. And it kind of reminds me of Ken, like, Ken, you're really good at making friends. Um, but Paul wasn't just like a soul winner. He was also a friend maker. And we're going to see this in his letter, but a question we're going to ask, do we like to make new friends? And I think this is like a really good quality to have. And Jesus had this quality. He was always meeting new people and interacting with them. Uh, but Warren Wearsby said that he noticed over the years in his ministry that the servants whom God used the most were people who would make friends. And for me, when I meet someone new, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I get a little nervous or scared when I walk into a new environment. And one thing my dad always told me is, you know, just ask people questions. And, you know, people like talking about what's going on in their life. So just ask them questions and that usually will get the ball, you know, rolling. And I just always, when I walk in a new room, I'm always praying, God, just help me. Give me the words to say, help me to, you know, make friends and be nice. But Paul is going to mention and greet over 30 of his friends in this last chapter, over 30 of them. And these friends he had come in contact with with him throughout his ministry during all of his missionary journeys. And some he led to the Lord and he stayed in contact with them um, through this whole time. And you can just see this love that he had between all of his friends. And it's a blessing um, being a believer because me and Sean always talk about this. Like when I wasn't walking with Jesus, I had like a very small group of friends. But once I got saved, and started going to church and, you know, going to different churches. It's like, boom, and Bible college. Like, I got friends all over the place now. And it's so encouraging because um, you can call people and you can stay with people. And it's like family. 
And it's actually pretty amazing because I have like friends all over the world. Like my best friend now lives in uh, Colorado and, and sometimes God, you know, shakes up and, you know, we spread out. I got another really good friend in Texas. I got Zach, Pastor Zach, you guys remember him in Georgia. I have my friend Tuk is in China. Um, I've got Wesley in India. I have Brian Ewing in Alaska. And so it's like I can call up any of these guys at any time and just talk to them about Jesus and life. And if I ever go and visit those places, I know I have a place to stay. Like they're just, they bring me in like family. And I'm sure all of you have friends like that too. But that's like the beauty of the body of Christ and the friends that we make. And I heard it said, if you want to have friends, uh, you need to be uh, friendly. And Paul was a great um, guy that made friends and he kept friends. But Paul mentions and greets his first friend in verses 1 through 2. So let's read verse 1 through 2. He says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. And there are so many names in here. I'm probably going to butcher a lot of them um, because they're not common names to us today. But first one is Phoebe. And Paul says she's a sister in the Lord. And her name actually means bright and radiant like a diamond. So it's a pretty um, name for a girl. But Paul calls Phoebe a sister in Christ. And it's very clear that she actually meant a lot to Paul. Um, She's the first one on the list. Out of over 30 people, Phoebe makes it number one. I'm writing to Phoebe, um, and he says she's a helper of many. She's a strengthener. That's what that word means, of many. That word helper used here is like a word that speaks of a mother, like nursing a child. Um, The infant, you know, gets nourished from the mother and the infant becomes, you know, strong and strengthened from the mom. And they say like breast milk is like way better than formula. Uh, But she's a strengthener. She's the one that has been used by God in a mighty way to strengthen many people in the church. And there's a great need for this mothering kind of ministry, I believe, in you know, all churches. And I know we've been blessed, me and Shauna, by all the moms um, just you know, loving on us and you know, being like a mother to all of us. And I think of you know, my mom, she was constantly strengthening me, like making meals for me. And like I'd be tired and weak after serving Jesus and she'd make me this hearty meal. You know, go take a nap, go take a shower. And then she'd pray for me before I get out the door. She was constantly strengthening me in the Lord. Um, you know, Shauna does the same thing. And, you know, I, I think of, um, uh, Amy with, uh, Marcus, she's, you know, constantly strengthening Marcus, just always on the phone with him. And, you know, Paul commenced her right off the bat and pointing out that Phoebe, this girl is valuable because she has nurtured and nourished many in the ministry of practicality. And I'll say this too, if this whole abortion bill gets overturned, which I hope it does. And, you know, they stop this craziness. But I think the church, we need to rise up and really take care of all these moms and these babies that, I mean, there's so many aborted babies that are getting aborted every year. But could you imagine all these new lives coming and all these new mothers? Like, it's going to be awesome. And, you know, but we're really going to have to step up and, and really be the hands and feet of Jesus and help these mothers out and these babies. But Phoebe was one who carried this letter Paul wrote to Rome. And so that means that she must have been very uh, trustworthy for Paul to entrust the book of Romans. Here's this letter. I want you to bring it to Rome. And that journey that she went on was from Corinth to Rome. It was traveling by land. She had to get on a ship. She had to travel through the sea. And Paul tells the church in Rome, when she arrives, I want you to receive her, take care of Phoebe. And Paul was very thankful and I'm also very thankful for the woman in, in the church and all the churches that I've been a part of. But Paul goes on to say in verses 3 through 4, he brings up a couple. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. So here we see Paul mentions his friends, uh, Priscilla and Aquila. 
And they were Paul's fellow workers, and they served Jesus together, this couple as like a ministry um, team. And it kind of reminds me of Ken and Linda, like they're, they were constantly opening up their house for church plants and they were traveling to different cities and they would open up their house and churches would be started, but they were a faithful husband and wife who served alongside of each other. And they were like inseparable. And I know when we had just our men's study, you know, um, Linda was like, I, I want to be with Ken, you know? And so that's how this all got is you know, we've got this group a Bible study together, which is, I believe, a lot better, but they're mentioned all over the New Testament, constantly serving Jesus together. And evidently, this valuable couple is now living in Rome, and some suggest that Paul actually sent this couple before him to do some of the groundwork before Paul would get to Rome. And then Paul commands the church to greet this couple. And that word greet means to receive, to accept, and to hold on to. And that was in, um, was that verse four? He says, verse three, he says, greet Priscilla. And then if you look at verse five, it says, greet my beloved. If you look at verse six, it says, greet Mary. If you look at verse seven, it says, greet Andrew. Verse eight, greet. Verse nine, verse 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 16. Greet, 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 greet. So you kind of get the picture. Paul's saying, he reminds them, I want you to receive one another. Like we're all family. We're all part of this mission together. I love how this couple is always mentioned together, always. And that, you know, points to and speaks to the fact that this husband and wife were working together for Jesus side by side. And I know for me and Shauna, um, when we serve Jesus together, I don't, God just does something spiritually and it's such a blessing to have her as my helpmate. And, you know, when I do worship by myself is a lot different than when I have Shauna with me. Like she really pulls through all my weaknesses and really, you know, carries us. And I think that's like what happens with couples is, you know, that one might be strong in one area, well, the other one might be weak, but then you, you really can balance each other out. And I, I believe this is how God designed uh, marriage. And, um, you know, two becoming one, serving Jesus together as a team. And the Bible says like a threefold cord is not quickly broken. And so when we have Jesus Christ in the middle of our relationship, um, we're going to have a strong marriage if we're both seeking Jesus first. And then Paul says that this couple was a courageous couple. Um, it's, Paul said they risked their, their necks for Paul. And we don't know exactly what they did, but they're constantly, it seems like, traveling, planning these churches. Um, but they risked their lives for Paul and the ministry and advancing God's kingdom and the gospel. And this couple's whole life was all about Jesus, charging for Jesus. Their life and marriage was all about making Jesus famous. And they're just this awesome ministry team. And then in verse 5, he says, likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved, Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. So this person, I'm not going to try to pronounce their name again, but this is probably the first convert um, person that Paul led to Jesus in that city. Um, and he's still in connection with this man. And then in verse 6, it says, Greet Mary, who labored much for us. And there are many girls named Mary in the Bible, and we don't know exactly which Mary this one is that Paul's talking about. But Paul says that she labored, labored much for us. And that word labor here means to labor to the point of exhaustion or ex like sweating. Um, it's the same word used in Luke 5 when the fishermen, you remember, toiled all night and they caught how much fish? Nothing. Um, but they toiled, they were sweating, and man, why aren't we catching anything? The same word is used in John 4, 6. When Jesus was weary from his uh, journey, the idea is sweating. She was a really hard worker. Mary was. And when Mary would serve the Lord, she gave everything that she had, just 100%. She rolled up her sleeve and she served Jesus with all that she had, poured herself out. And this is a great example for us in, you know, serving Jesus. She labored to the point of exhaustion. 
And, you know, I think, you know, God wants each one of us to serve him in whatever he's called us to do. But then it's important to be filled up by Jesus so that you can continue serving um, Jesus. So we get filled up, you know, and then we pour out, get filled up, poured out. And we can labor for the Lord and get tired in the work. I'm sure you guys have all been tired in the work laboring for Jesus, but we should never be get tired of the work, you know, because I don't think there's any greater joy than advancing God's kingdom and seeing people won over for Jesus. But you remember in Mark 6, 31, um, the apostles had, Jesus had sent them out to do all the sorts of ministry and they came back and Jesus told them, Um, I want you guys to come aside by yourself to a deserted place and rest a while. And it's so important that we do, because we're going to burn out if we just pour out, pour out, pour out, and we don't come aside by ourselves and have that quiet time and really rest and fill up um, by the Lord. And I heard one pastor say, and it's always really hit me, but he said, Sometimes the the most spiritual thing you can do is just take a nap. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been there. It's like that nap just resets you, recharges you to continue just serving the Lord. And I don't know of another person in the Bible that's more of a hard worker than Paul. I mean, this guy is crazy. He's going, he's like a little, you know, those pinball machine, ding, 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 like just going all over for Jesus. Um, But when he's impressed by Mary. She, he said she labored a lot. She must have really labored a lot if Paul was this hard worker. And then in verse 7, he says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. We'll stop right there for a second. But Paul was in prison for his faith constantly. Um, the Bible says that he was in imprisonment frequently. And it kind of, rem- I was like driving over here and I was reminded of uh, Bundy. He just, <laughs> imprisonment <laughs> frequently. It kind of reminded me of Paul. Um, just wherever he went, he just always get locked up for his faith. Uh, but in verse eight, he says, Greet uh, am." Leas, my beloved in the Lord, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and uh, Stashes, my beloved, greet Apellus, approved in Christ, greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus, uh, greet Herodian, my countryman, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, uh, who are in the Lord, greet Typhina, and try. Fosa, uh, who have labored in the Lord, greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, and his mother and mine. And so here we see Paul greets another whole bunch of his friends that he served in the ministry with. Um, But I want to point out to you Rufus. And Paul says, Rufus, his mom, was like my mom. Like, I don't know if you've ever had friends that they were pretty much like your parents or your mom. I, I've had some of those in my past, and they're such a blessing. So Rufus's mom was like a mother to Paul, and many scholars believe that Rufus's dad was Simon, who carried the cross of Jesus. Uh, remember when Jesus was unable to carry his cross um, in Mark chapter fifteen, verse twenty-one. And a Roman soldier picked out Simon and says, all right, you got to carry Jesus's cross. Uh, Mark 15, 21 says, they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. I mean, could you imagine being there in that crowd and you see Jesus with the cross and then all of a sudden, a Roman soldier points to you and says, all right, you, you got to bear that cross now. And I believe this really impacted Simon, and he gave his life to Jesus. Um, and could you imagine him trying to re-explain that story to his son and to his wife after coming home from work that day or traveling? Like, you wouldn't believe what just happened. And it, the Bible, I believe, does record that he ended up getting saved and his wife and his son, Rufus. Um, he said, greet Apelles, uh, he's approved in Christ. 
Paul calls them approved, which is a very like interesting word. Um, the word approved is um, very powerful. In ancient times, they would use um, gold to buy and sell. But the thing with gold, it's very soft. And so people that um, weren't that great of people, what they would do is they would take a knife and shave off some of the gold off of the coins. And so they would just make a little pile of all these flakes of every single coin that they had, and then they were able to melt down that gold and make more money. And a lot of the banks and people that sold things would take these smaller coins that weren't the right value because they've been devalued because people were shaving them off. Well, whenever there was a, a bank or a business or a person that like weighed those coins and they inspected it to make sure it was the right size, it was the same Greek word. They were approved and they were trustworthy. They were above reproach. They were men and women of integrity. And so what a great, um, what would you say? Uh, what a great title to be as a Christian. This guy was approved. Like he was a man of integrity. He was honest. And I think it's so important as Christians that we should be above reproach. We should, you know, have integrity. We should be trustworthy people and we shouldn't cut corners. And that's something I believe we should all desire to be approved. And so what a great title Apelles holds. But the Bible talks about someone who's truly got the stamp of God on them. God's approval, uh, the Bible says that they study the word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent to present yourself, what is it? Approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's that word approved again. And, you know, by the way, God approves the fact that, you know, we go to church on Sunday and, and have, you know, Bible studies in our men and women of the word. And then let's read verse 14 through 15. He says, greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patro, Baz, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet this is a, the great one. I'm going to focus in on this one. Greet Philogos and Julia, Nereus, his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. So here we see Paul greets many more of his friends. And I want to point out um, Philogos. I think that's how you say it. I'm probably not saying it right. But his name, it means lover of the word. Um, it comes from two Greek words, uh, phleo, which is lover, and logos, which is the word. And I heard this interesting story of this um, little tiny second grader, and he wanted to get a Bible. So his parents took him to, you know, the I don't know, I would go to the Calvary Chapel bookstore. And so he walks in, and he's all excited to get his Bible. His mom and dad are with him. And he, he walks in boldly in, into the store and says, Mom, I want your Bible. I want the same Bible that Mommy's got. And the dad's like, you don't want, what about my Bible? And he said, I want Mommy's Bible. And the dad's like, why? And um, he said, well, Mommy's is more interesting because she reads hers every day, but you never read yours. And so I want her Bible. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Um, but, you know, he, he could tell that his mom was a lover of the word. And that's what this guy was. He was a lover of the word. And then verse 16, um, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. And so back then, um, it was a very common thing when you went to church that you, they would kiss each other on the cheek, and they call that like the holy kiss. And some countries still practice it that today. My grandma still does that, and my aunt used to do that with me when, I was, when she was alive. Um, and I know Brixton and Harley always get holy kisses at church um, every weekend because they come home and they got, you know, lipstick all over them. <laughs> I think it's Joanna. <laughs> Um, but 
by the third century, uh, the the leaders of the church kind of stopped that. They kind of put the kibosh on that because people were getting a little too excited about the holy kisses. And so um, they said, no, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, but today it's more common, you know, just to give a nice handshake or a Marlin bear hug, you know. Um, but the idea Paul is making is just be friendly, be, be kind. You know, we're all brothers and sisters. Be warm. Don't, you know, be cold. Don't be standoffish is the whole idea. And then let's read verse 17 through 19. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. So here we see Paul warns the church of false uh, teachers who are causing divisions and they're teaching things not according to the Bible and sound doctrine. And he tells them to note them and mark them. So just take a spray paint can and spray paint their foreheads orange. Um, I'm just kidding. But he says, mark them, like make a note. Okay, this person is not on the right track with us doctrinally on the essentials. And it means to identify them, keep an eye on them. And there's so many false teachers um, today. And the Bible says that during the last times, when we come closer, there's going to be more and more false teachers happening and causing divisions. They're not teaching things according to the Bible. And so we need to be aware of them. And, you know, some of those people that we need to note and make a mark are like the Mormons. We got to make a note and mark out the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, There's a lot of, you know, TV evangelists that says, you know, send me your money and, you know, I'll send you this magic wallet. And, you know, even though Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, they're, they're very nice people. Like we've said before, they're probably the nicest people you'll meet, but they teach bad doctrine. They deceive and they're actually wolves in sheep's clothing, whether they know it or not, they're very deceived and they're deceiving actually a lot of people. And Paul says right here, they don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ. They serve their version of Jesus, but it's not the true Lord. And Paul says, for your protection, stay away from them if they don't want to hear you and what you have to say when you present it. If they keep on bringing you back to what they believe, just stay away from note them. And that word note is interesting. It's the same word for scope or a microscope or a telescope, and it carries the idea of looking very closely at something or having an intense observation toward something. In the context, Paul is exhorting the saints in Rome to look very closely at the false teachers. And these false teachers, and I'll say every single teacher, even me, make sure everything I'm saying is lining up with the word of God. And these false teachers are recognized because of the fact that they bring divisiveness and offenses. They're a stumbling block, tripping somebody up and causing them to fall. And that's like what false teachers do is they'll try to mislead you. Uh, Galatians 1, 6, and we should have brought this verse up when we had that, those guys over. But they said, um, Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you, that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And so we need to be very careful because these false teachers, they're going to say anything to get their point across, to have, you know, they're going to use smooth and flattering words to deceive. And I I think it was that, that one boy that was sitting over there and he says, well, when I read this, like he, he was using really smooth words and feeling. And like, when I read this, like it really ministered to me and you should do that also. And it's like, we gotta be very careful of that. These flattering words to deceive. 
Um, and I think we need to be sensitive to the Spirit because if someone is teaching a false gospel and they're truly inquiring of the truth, if they truly want to know the truth, I think we should stay and we should talk with them and you know explain why we believe what we believe. And we just have to be kind of in tune with the Spirit. Like, is this person sold out on their stuff or are they really seeking the truth? You know, but if they're only out to argue and debate and just to press their point home, just constantly just pressing their point home and home and home and they just ignore everything that we say, um, I think it's better just to just move on. And, you know, there's a lot of other people that are more willing to listen to what we have to say. And there's a lot of dying people out there that are willing to listen to us that need Jesus. And this is kind of an interesting statistic. I don't know how true it is, but um, I read this week that 80% of all converts into Mormonism came from a Christian church background. I don't know if that's true, but... If that is true, I believe it's because they remained simple in the scriptures. They never went deep in the scriptures. They never got that good foundation of solid doctrine. And they never learned the word of God. And that's why it's so important to go book by book, chapter by chapter. Um, That way we know the whole word and we're not suckers to this kind of stuff. And you could see a lot of these different religions are very crafty. And they'll, you know, like Jesus said, you know, he might deceive you by being an angel of light. And it looks really good on the outside, but once you pry in a little deeper, if you don't know the deep theology, um, they can really mislead you down the road. But Paul continued to say, they do not serve our Lord. And I think that's significant because they're not serving Jesus. So apparently they're serving a different Jesus. And I believe that Every religion apart from Christianity is demonic and they're leading people to hell and they serve a different Lord, a different Jesus. And so we need to search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are true that we're listening to. And we need to test everything and not just accept it because it feels right to me. And that's like what they were saying is it feels so good to me. So you should, because it's going to make you feel really good. Um, you know, and people say, well, 65% of the population is okay with this, this, and this. Well, even though it might sound good and you might want everybody to go to heaven, but what does the Bible just say, you know? And it doesn't matter what we think, feel, or believe or what the world might put in front of us. The question we got to ask is, you know, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? What does God's word say? And Jesus told us in Matthew 10, 16, he said, I sent you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so I believe God wants us to be very skilled with our Bibles and, you know, be wise as it pertains to the word of God. And that's why we need to know the Bible from cover to cover and be experts in the truth. And that way we can, you know, spot out that person has a phony faith. Um, It's counterfeit. We can spot it from a mile away. And, you know, as we can see, there's a ton of evil in the world today. Paul brings us up. um, And the Bible talks about how it's going to wax, you know, worse and worse as we go farther along. Um, But we've got some good news in verse 20. I think you'll like it. It says in verse 20, And the God of peace will do what to Satan? will crush Satan under your feet. How fast? Shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay, so God is going to crush Satan um, under, he says, under your foot shortly, um, just like we, you know, crush a bug. Um, God is going to win. And God's going to deal with all the evil that's in the world uh, today. And, you know, he's eventually going to take care of that. Uh, Revelation 20 tells us that Satan's going to be bound with a chain and cast into the bottomless pit. And, you know, God is going to shut him up for a thousand years uh, when Christ comes back and reigns um, for those thousand years. And this is what I love. It says that um, in Revelation 20, that during those when he's locked up, he won't be able to deceive the nations anymore. Isn't that pretty amazing? And Jesus will be king. There's going to be no more deceiving from Satan during that time. 
And so Satan is going to be bound shortly. And so that's just a good encouragement for us just to hang in there. And it's going to happen because God said it's going to happen in Revelation chapter 20. And, you know, Paul says, amen. So this is his second closing. I think it was last chapter. Paul closed down chapter 15 by saying, amen. Now he does amen again, but he's a preacher and he's got another thing to say. So he goes on. He says, wait, there's more. Um, He brings up Timothy. He says, Timothy in verse 21, my fellow worker and Lucius, Jason, so... Pater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Cordus, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So Paul finishes his roll call of all of his faithful friends here and who served with him. And he mentions Timothy and Timothy was a son in the faith to Paul and Timothy had ministered next to Paul in many places. And, you know, Paul had raised him up in the ministry. Um, And Paul said of Timothy, there's no one more like minded than Timothy. And, you know, it's because, you know, Paul discipled Timothy. And it's so important that we are discipled and that we are also discipling other uh, people um, when they, when God brings them into our life. And, you know, that we're encouraging those um, that are newer in the faith how to walk with, you know, Jesus. And, you know, I'm so thankful for uh, Pastor Kevin, um, he was the, the junior high pastor at the time, and he just took me in underneath his wing when I gave my life to Christ. And, you know, Pastor John poured into me, and he discipled me. And I'm very thankful for those men for discipling me um, in the Lord. And, um, and then all my Bible college teachers, like, they really just poured into me and invested into me. And I remember one of my Bible college teachers, um, he's known to ask a question when he teaches the book of Romans, but right off the bat, when the kids sit down and there's a lot of like know-it-all in Bible college, you know, like the kids are very um, debate-ish and and, and they they really like to to challenge other people, but he always starts off the book of Romans. He says, um, who wrote the book of Romans? And everyone in one accord in unison would say, Paul. And he would say, eh, Paul didn't write the book of Romans. And uh, everyone would just look at him like he had like a third eye from the planet, uh, from outer, outer space. And, but he would always have them turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 22, the verse we just read. And he had them stand up and read this. Romans 16, verse 22, we just read over it. It says, I, Tertullus, who wrote this epistle, greets you in the Lord. And all the kids would just get like super embarrassed. Um, But you guys can pull that trick on your friends or family. Um, But this guy, he was actually Paul's secretary. And so Paul spoke the the book of Romans, but this guy was like his, would you call it his dictator? Or not dictator. Um, (laughs) uh, A scribe, yeah. And so he would pin down all this because I think Paul had bad eyesight and couldn't really write that well. And so um, this guy dictated this letter and Paul spoke it. And then in verse 25, I love this. I think 25 is my favorite verse out of Romans 16. It says, Now to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And I love this phrase, who is able to establish us who's able to establish us 
And so what does God do? He establishes each one of us. That's what God does. And that word establish is like getting a steroid. Like it makes you strong. It makes you firm. It makes you to be able to be stable and secure. And if there's one thing that people are looking for in their lives today, it's to be stable. It's to be, have security, to have strength, empowerment, and to be established. But the problem is we often look to strength and stability and consistency in the world and in the things of the world. But Paul tells us there's only one way we can be established is by God, by Jesus. And God strengthens us. He establishes us. And nothing else in the world is going to be able to make us stable and consistent like Jesus. You know, Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's always with us. He said he's the same, you know, yesterday, today, and forever. And then I love how Paul closed out the book of Romans. He said, God alone is uh, wise. And so if we want wisdom, we just got to ask him and go to his word um, for his wisdom. So let's close with prayer. So dear God, I just want to thank you so much for um, this journey that we got to go on um, through your word. And God, I just thank you so much um, how you trusted these men to write down your words for us and that you preserved them all these years. And Lord, I just pray that um, we would take all these truths um, to heart. And God, I pray that you would just strengthen us in these days and just to be bold witnesses for you. And I pray if there's anyone um, watching online or watches this video later and they don't know you and they want to be established by you, they want to be a part of your family, to be your friend and to have you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they would give their life um, to you. And there's all these names written down um, in this last chapter. And, and you said, if we give our life to you, you'll write our name down in the book of life and be your friend forever um, in heaven. And so Lord, I pray if there's those that are watching online um, that they would give their life to you right now. Um, and so if you want to do that, um, it's just a simple prayer just saying, Jesus, I want you, I need you. I believe in you. And so you can just say this prayer. Um, Thank you, God, for your love for me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again three days later. God, I want to follow you all the days of my life. And I need your help to walk this life following you. So fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.